morning of the funeral, me and Lawrence get up early, and we're getting ready to go to Philadelphia. And my uncle's up, and he's getting ready to head up to New York for his meeting with Blackie Napoli and Bobby Manor. So, my uncle says, tonight when I get back, we'll meet up for dinner. When you guys are up there today, keep your antennas up. I want to know who's saying what and who's gathering with who. As Philip Leonetti and Lawrence Merlino were on their way to Philadelphia for Phil Testa's funeral, Nicky Scarfo was on his way to North Jersey to meet with Blackie Napoli and Bobby Manna in the back room of an Italian restaurant in Hoboken to discuss the future of the Bruno crime family and more specifically, little Nikki's future as its boss. Ten years prior, the trio of Scarfo, Napoli, and Mana walked the track together at Yardville State Prison, where they discussed their future plans as mob leaders. My uncle was very tight with those guys, ever since they were in Yardville together. Scarfo told Mana everything he had learned about Phil Testa's death the beef with Chicky Narducci, the rumors about the Irish, and his less than friendly meeting with Pete Casella the night of the wake. Scarfo told Manna he believed Casella, Narducci, and others not yet known to him were behind Testa's murder. Manna told Scarfo that whoever had killed Philip Testa did not have the permission of the commission, and as such, the hit was unsanctioned. As it had done with the unsanctioned murder of Testa's predecessor, Angelo Bruno, the commission would launch an immediate investigation to identify those responsible and to make arrangements to met out the appropriate punishment, death. Sitting at the head of the commission was Mana's boss and Scarfo's friend and ally, Vincent the Changiganti. Mana told Scarfo he would schedule a meeting in a week that both Scarfo and Casella would present their case to the Genovese hierarchy, which consisted of Giganti, Mana, and Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the same individuals who presided over the investigation of Angelo Bruno's murder just one year prior, and who had ordered the gruesome torture killings of those involved. This time around, the Genovese would be without their Minister of Manipulation, Frank Funzi Thierry, who was on his deathbed in a prison hospital after being convicted of racketeering, sentenced to 10 years in prison. With or without Thierry, the deck was heavily stacked in Scarfo's favor, and little Nicky knew it. In one week, he would likely become the undisputed boss of Philadelphia in Atlantic City. That night, after his meeting with Blackie and Bobby Mana, me and my uncle went out to dinner at Caesar's. I told him about the funeral, and he told me about the meeting. He says to me, for the next week, until I go to New York, we gotta watch our P's and Q's. We're gonna stay close to home. 
And this fucking treachery may not be over. With Scarfo on the cusp of assuming the throne, Atlantic City was crawling with wise guys, all looking to curry favor with little Nikki. It was like overnight, every wise guy and their mother wanted to come to Atlantic City to see my uncle for one reason or another. And this is in the days leading up to the meeting in New York. It was me and Lawrence in the office. And we'd see this one and that one, whoever came. My uncle stayed upstairs in his apartment. He didn't come down to see anyone. And they were all coming to score points. And we knew it. The day was finally here. It was finally time for the meeting with the Genovese leadership in New York. The meeting was set for 1 p.m. inside Vincent the Chin Gigante's personal headquarters, the Triangle Social Club on Sullivan Street in New York's Greenwich Village. Nikki Scarfo and Pete Casella would sit before Gigante, his consigliere Bobby Manor, and his front boss, Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, and learn their respective fates as Giganti, the Il Capo di Tutti Capi of the Commission, dictated the future of the Philadelphia Atlantic City mob. Me and my uncle were up early, dressed and ready to go. I'm driving him to New York for his meeting with the Chin. In addition to getting him up there on time, I also had to make sure we didn't pick up any tails. Once we're in the city, my uncle starts going over the protocol for the meeting. We were to first go to a restaurant in Little Italy, and then they would send for my uncle. He would go to the meeting, and I'd stay at the restaurant. When we got there, we went into the restaurant the first guy we see is Benny X. Venero Benny X Mangano was one of Chinjaganti's closest friends and was the reputed underboss of the Genovese crime family. Benny X says, Nick, it's good to see you. And he gives my uncle a kiss on the cheek. Ben, it's good to see you as well. I want you to meet my nephew, Philip Leonetti. He's a friend of ours. Benny shakes my hand and gives me a kiss on the cheek and says to me, So, this is the young man I've heard so much about. He couldn't have been nicer to us. He tells us to have a seat and right away they start bringing over food and drinks. He says to my uncle, let's wait a while for the other guy to get here. Then we'll get you over there. Meaning the club where the gym was. As Scarfo, Leonetti, and Mangano make small talk, at 12.45 p.m. sharp, three Genovese soldiers walk into the restaurant and Benny Eggs excuses himself from the table. Now, the meeting is scheduled for one. Me and my uncle get there at noon. And here it's 12.45. And Pete Casella is nowhere to be found. My uncle checks his watch and whispers to me, I'll bet you this cocksucker ain't gonna show. I just made a face back at my uncle, like, no way. Because that was a major fucking no-no. You get called for to a meeting with the boss of the commission and you don't go? The penalty is death. No questions asked. So, 
Now Benny X comes back and says, I sent one of those fellas back to see what they want to do. If they want to get started, I'll wait a bit longer for the other guy. So, five minutes later, the guy comes back and he whispers in Benny X's ear. And he says to me and my uncle, it may be a little while. What Scarfo and Leonetti did not know was that while Scarfo had his ace in the hole with Bobby Manor, from their days together in Yardville State Prison, Pete Casella had made a similar connection with a powerful Genovese captain when the two men were doing time together on federal drug trafficking charges. At that very moment, the Genovese captain was pleading Casella's case to Gigante, Mana, and Salerno, trying to intervene on his behalf by either swaying the Genovese leaders to name Casella the new boss of the Philadelphia Atlantic City mob, or at a minimum, spare his life in the event Giganti was looking to make an example, as he did with Antonio Tony Bananas, Cabernegro. The whole time we were sitting there, the same guy who was running back and forth between Benny Eggs and the chimp keeps coming and going, whispering to Benny each time he does. All of a sudden, the door opens and here comes Pete Casella. He has Rocco Marinucci with him. Benny gets up to greet him, and Pete introduces Rocco as a friend of mine, which means he's not Cosa Nostra. He's not made. Benny's colors change. He won't shake Rocco's hand. You can't bring him in here, Benny says to Pete. And one of the Genovese guys barks at Rocco. Go wait in the fucking car. And Rocco is out the door. He never looks back. It was almost four o'clock. And Pete, he didn't even get a chance to sit down. The guy who was going back and forth all day, he reappears and whispers to Benny. And Benny says, Gentlemen, they're ready for you. And my uncle and Pete are being escorted towards the door. Benny says, Nick, I'm going to stay here with your nephew. Teach him how to play cards. We all laughed. Everyone, except for Pete. Pete looked like he was scared to death. As Philip Leonetti and Benny X Mangano played cards, Nicodemo Scarfo and Pete Casella were taken to the Triangle Social Club, which was only three blocks away. The windows on the nondescript storefront were completely blacked out. And inside, there were two chairs. One for Scarfo, one for Casella. Sitting across from the two Philadelphia mobsters, behind a table, were the three Genovese leaders. Giganti was seated in the middle, in his trademark bathrobe. The stone-faced manna was to his left, and the dour-looking Salerno to his right, wearing his trademark fedora and puffing on a cigar that remained firmly between his teeth. According to Scarfo, who later told Leonetti what happened at the meeting, Gigante wasted no time with pleasantries. He started the meeting by speaking directly to Casella. Listen. We know what happened. Don't lie to us. You lie to us. We can't help you. 
Tell us the names of everyone who was involved in this fucking disgrace of a plot. It was me. It was my idea. Me, Chicky Narducci, and Rocco Marinucci, and the kid Rocco knows. Scarfo said Fat Tony took the cigar out of his mouth and barked. This motherless fuck. The kid. He got a name? I don't know his name. And then he hangs his head in shame. Giganti smacks the table and Casella looks up at him. And then the dawn speaks. You are finished. You ought to retire immediately to Florida. You are forbidden from ever returning to Philadelphia. When you leave here, you get on a fucking plane and you disappear. You breathe a word of this to anybody. We will kill you. Your brother. Your brother-in-law. You understand me? Casella nods his head, and Giganti gestures for one of the Genevieve soldiers to escort him out of the club. As Casella attempts to shake Giganti's hand, Giganti stares at him in disgust and spits on the floor in his direction. Casella is whisked away. Well, Nick. I don't see anyone else here. I guess that makes you the new boss. At which point, Giganti stands. Scarfo approaches the table and kisses Giganti on each cheek as Mana and Salerno clap their hands. Scarfo would also kiss Mana and Salerno in a similar fashion. Nicodemo Dominic Scarfo was now the undisputed boss of the Philadelphia Atlantic City mob. He had just turned 52 years old and was strategically aligned with New York's Genovese crime family and Vincent the Chin Giganti, the most powerful mob boss in the nationwide crime syndicate known as the Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. The underworld in Philadelphia and Atlantic City would never be the same. And that night, when Scarfo and Leonetti returned to Georgia Avenue, there was a small contingency waiting for them. It was Chucky, Lawrence, Salvi, and Frank Monty. I introduced my uncle to them as their new boss. Everyone was hugging each other, kissing each other on the cheek. The five of us go down to Angeloni's for drinks, to celebrate. My uncle tells us, we gotta let things settle a bit before we start making any changes. We gotta do it right, one step at a time. This is a whole new fucking ball game. Everyone was happy, but it seemed like Salvi was a little out of it. I think he was expecting my uncle to say our first order of business is we're gonna kill this one, or we're gonna kill that one, the guys who had killed his father. But my uncle was saying, we're gonna take things slow, let the smoke clear which was definitely the right move for the organization. Nicky Scarfo enjoyed a steady stream of visitors to his Atlantic City headquarters over the next few weeks as members and associates of the Bruno crime family came to pledge their allegiance to the new boss. Scarfo would also travel to Philadelphia 
and meet with the captains left over from the Bruno and Testa regimes to discuss the family's new hierarchy. Nicky Scarfo would name his close friend, Salvatore Chucky Merlino, as underboss, and Testa loyalist Frank Monti to the post of conciliary. Within a few short months, Scarfo would name four new capo regimes, Joseph Chicky Cengalini, Salvatore Salvi Testa, Lawrence Yogi Merlino, and his 28-year-old nephew, Philip Crazy Phil Leonetti. Scarfo kept his old captain, Alfred Freddy Aizi, on board, but the old timer was already semi-retired. Scarfo also kept Bruno era captains Santo Big Santo Idion and Joseph Joscafidi in place, but took down John Johnny Capello, the brother-in-law of the recently deposed Pete Casella. Scarfo kept the treacherous Frank Chicky Narducci in place for the time being. But little Nicky had already decided that Narducci's days were numbered for his involvement in the bombing death of Phil Testa. Me, Chucky, and Lawrence, we were the only ones who knew what Pete Casella had told the Chin about the plot to kill Phil Testa. My uncle was afraid if Salvi knew or even Frank Monty, that they'd want to kill Chicken or Ducci immediately. My uncle says, we're going to kill him. We're just not going to kill him yet. As March turned into April, little Nicky and his new regime were in full swing. Business was good, and it was about to get a whole lot better. One day, me and my uncle are having lunch with Saul Kane and Lawrence. And Saul says, Nick, I got an idea for you. You should start a street tax. The way it works is you tax everybody who's doing anything illegal. You offer them the protection and support of the family in exchange for them paying the street tax. I know it's been done in Chicago and real big in New York in the 30s and 40s. I think you could make a shitload of money doing this. My uncle's eyes lit up. He knew we had the muscle to enforce it. He made a face at me and I made a face back at him. We both smiled. From that moment on, the imposition and collection of the street tax became our number one priority, one of our biggest money makers. As Scarfa was setting out to restructure the organization, each made member had to formally come in, sit down with the boss and the underboss, to talk about what they had going on. Guys had to come in and report what they had going on, who was doing what, so we could figure out what was out there and what we were going to collect, both as tribute and as the street tax. A lot of guys hadn't been paying Ange or Phil Testa the right amount in tribute for years. Some guys weren't paying at all. My uncle told everybody that came in the same thing. I'll tell you what, those days are over. You and your people, you're gonna pay what you're supposed to pay. Or it's this. Scarfo had assembled a group of killers around him, and everyone knew it. 
Despite that, there were those in the underworld who did not heed the new boss's warning. Men like Chelsea Stevie Boris, the leader of Philadelphia's Greek mob. Boris had blatantly balked at Scarfo's demand and that he be forced to pay the mob's new street tax. Scarfo swiftly ordered his murder to send a message to anyone else considering not paying. My uncle had long John set it up because he was close to Boris. Raymond Long John Martirano, the one-time aide to Angelo Bruno, who had helped Scarfo murder union boss John McCullough in December of 1980, set up a dinner party at a restaurant in Philadelphia and invited Boris to join him and his wife and several other people for a night out. Boris brought his young girlfriend to the restaurant and everyone was having a good time until two men in ski masks entered the restaurant and motioned for Mortorano and the others to move as they opened fire on Boris, killing him with a barrage of bullets and killing his young date who got caught in the crossfire. The cold-blooded mob killing of Stevie Boris sent the rest of the Philadelphia underworld scurrying to pay Scarfo's street tax, and Scarfo's crews were bringing in money by the truckload. Once we got it going good, we were bringing in a hundred grand a month, and that's just in street tax money. Don't forget, we still had gambling, loan shocking, and extortion operations. So on a really good month, we could bring in half a million or more. Hard cash. With Scarfo and Leonetti based in Atlantic City, Salvatore Chucky Morlino and Salvi Testa were running the day-to-day -day operations of the family in South Philadelphia. Things were great in the beginning, especially after we killed Stevie Boris. Everyone was doing their job and we were making a shitload of money. Everybody was paying. My uncle was happy and things were really good. Except for a refusal from a South Philadelphia loan shark and drug dealer named Johnny Calabrese who balked at Scarfo's new street tax. Scarfo responded with the sign of the gun. We approached Chicky Cengalini, who was close with Calabrese, and he set it up. Two guys from his crew, Tommy Del Giorno and Fafi Inarella, were the shooters. Another guy named Pat Spirito was the getaway driver. As Chick was walking Calabrese to his car, Tommy and Fafi came out of an alley and blasted him. He died in the street. There's an old Italian card game called Ziganet. I'm sure that's not the right word in Italian. And this is surely an Italian-American word. Anyway, the game, which is actually the Sicilian version of poker, was one of the biggest rackets in Philadelphia, way back in the mid to late 70s, before all of the horror started. The games were run by a man named Frank Chicky Narducci. I loved Mr. Narducci, as I always called him. Sal and his son Frank, they were very close friends. And I was close with Frank's girlfriend, Sandy. Chicky was a barrel-chested guy with slightly bent ears, a bald head, 
and a purely handsome face, cracked in half, always, by the biggest smile I have ever seen. He was full of warmth, welcome, and generosity. Whenever Salvi said, you want to go to Frankie's house? I couldn't wait to put on some lipstick and hop in the car. Every Christmas Eve, they had an open house, and people filed in all night long, starting at around 6 p.m. and finishing well into the early morning hours of Christmas morning. The basement was a big open loft space, and the food, it was endless. There was always tons of people and music and joy. Christmas Eve was a party, not a solemn, holy celebration. It was yet another opportunity to invite a billion people into his home, to partake in his food, generosity, and sense of joya de la vida, and enjoy themselves fully and totally. Naturally, at midnight, Chicky would enter dressed as Santa Claus with a stuffed sack full of presents. Back to Chicky's cigarette games. The action all happened in a little old converted garage in South Philadelphia, somewhere around 7th and Morton. I remember walking into a dark doorway with no signage, no lights, no nothing, saying to Sal, where the hell are you taking me? What? You don't trust me? It's Chicky's place. You'll see. Just hold my hand. The lights inside were dim, but after a few moments, your eyes got used to it. The space was no frills, bare walls, with fluorescent lights and cement floors, but the food table was lavish, full of trays of sausage and peppers, roast beef, roast pork, meatballs, broccoli rabe, baked ziti, garlic bread and salad. There was a cash bar and sweets tables, and everyone was playing ziganet at long folding tables. Judges, big name lawyers, politicians, fancy pants mainline bankers, waspy white bread types. They all loved our way down here in South Philadelphia and just wanted to be a part of it all. And so they were. The action was non-stop and the noise was sometimes unbearable with all of the people shouting and screaming and piped in music in the background. I just loved meeting all of these people from all walks of life. Salvi played a bit and I just watched. But I, I was just happy to be there the two or three times I spent with him. And the atmosphere was very nightclub-y. Lots of music, Sinatra, the classics, and the people. They were all very spirited and jovial, totally in the moment. In the middle of it all, on top of a huge ladder, maybe 12 feet high, Chicky watched over all the activity. In those days, there were no closed circuit surveillance, at least not in a garage in South Philadelphia. Then, invariably, after hours of the guys handing him plates of food and drinks up there on that ladder, he'd get blasted and come down and sing. 
All the action would stop and the whole crowd would just silently and happily indulge him. It was pretty magical. And the first time I went, Chicky sang Pennies from Heaven. And every time he sang the title, all the people in the crowd threw their coins on him. Every time it rains, it rains Pennies from Heaven Don't you know each cloud Contains pennies from heaven. You'll find your fortune falling all over the town. Be sure that your umbrella is upside down. Three weeks after the Calabrese killing. Little Nicky turned his attention on an aging mob associate named Frank Frankie Flowers the Alfonso. Frankie Flowers wasn't a mean guy. He was an associate. He made a ton of money with Ange. They were involved in a lot of things together, both illegal and legal stuff. So when my uncle becomes boss, he sends for Flowers. The guy doesn't come in. So my uncle tells Selvi, I want you to give him a beating. Don't kill him, but bust him up. Make sure he knows this is a new regime and he's gonna pay like everybody else. Scarfo knew that D. Alfonso was a huge earner he also hoped that a beating at the hands of Salvi Testa would bring the old timer around. Salvi and Gino Milano, who was one of Salvi's guys, they set up a meeting with Flowers and he falls for it. He's walking to the meeting, which was going to take place on the street in the 9th Street Italian market in South Philadelphia. As he's walking, Salvi and Gino jump out from behind a car. Salvi has a baseball bat. Gino has a steel bar. They give Flowers the beating of his fucking life. They busted him up. Pretty good. When an ambulance crew found Di Alfonso, he was semi-conscious, bleeding in the street. At the hospital, it was determined that his skull had been fractured, his jaw broken, several bones in his face were also broken, and one of his kneecaps had been shattered. De Alfonso would spend the next month in a South Philadelphia hospital, recuperating. By the time he was out, it was almost Christmas. And Philadelphia's new mob don, Nicky Scarfo, decided to throw himself a party. There was a place on South Street called La Susina that we used to go to. Sam the Baba, who was with us, owned it. We rented the place out and threw a big party. Everyone in the family was there. You should have seen the fucking spread. Shrimp, lobster, champagne, the best of everything. It was a great fucking party. Everyone who came brought my uncle an envelope for Christmas. Some envelopes had a couple hundred in them. Some had a couple thousand. And by the end of the night, I think my uncle had made almost a hundred grand just from the envelopes. Towards the end of the night, I'm sitting at a table with my uncle and Chucky. My uncle motions for Salvi to come over. My uncle says to Salvi, I think it's time. 
Time for what, Nick? Your father. Salvi's eyes get real big. My uncle says, two guys. He nods towards Chicken Arducci, who is standing a few feet away from us, talking to some guys at the bar. That's one of them. The other one is the young kid with the pizza shop. Pete's friend. Salvi nods his head. He's staring straight ahead in Chicken Arducci's direction. Almost like he's in a trance. My uncle says, You handle it. How you see fit. I want you to do this for your father and for this family. Salvi's sitting there, his eyes well up with tears. He leans in, hugs my uncle, and gives him a kiss on the cheek. He wipes his eyes and says, Thank you, Nick. He gets up, and in the blink of an eye, he's out the fucking door. I think his emotions had gotten the best of him. No one knew that Pete had given up Chicky and Rocco Marinucci, except for my uncle. And the only people he told were me, Chucky, and Lawrence. We knew, but no one else in the family knew. Now we're here at the Christmas party, and my uncle tells Salvi he gives him permission to kill both guys. It was a great way to end the year. <laughs>